Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. The day this all started seemed as boring and mundane as any other. My wife Sarah and I were going to the movies to see a comedy that she was interested in and that I was not. We had driven across the city and parked in an overpriced parking lot stepping over the sleeping forms of filthy homeless people and the used needles and cigarette butts that littered the sidewalks here. I was listening to Sarah talk about the recent rise of gutter oil and spit oil in China, both horrifying topics in their own right. As Sarah went on to explain to me, gutter oil was when restaurants in China scooped up the vegetable oil from the trash cans out back of the restaurant. They would use the filthy, carcinogen-ridden oil to cook food for new customers. Spit oil was when Chinese restaurants would just take the broth from bowls where customers had finished eating and reheat it. They would then pour the reused spit oil broth into new bowls with fresh pieces of meat and vegetables added and serve it to the next customer. This was broth that someone else, a total stranger, was just drooling into. It's so disgusting, Sarah said over the din of contrast traffic as she brushed a lock of hair the color of chestnuts behind her ear. The crosswalk turned green and we started ahead with Sarah in the lead. It shows that China really is just a paper tiger, at least in terms of its economy. The people are so desperate there. I saw a blur of something pale behind us, something tall and spidery that slunk through the crowd. I quickly spun my head, but I only saw groups of people milling around. I wondered if I was hallucinating for a moment. Are you listening to me? Sarah said, and I saw she was looking at me now with a queer expression on her face. Her eyes always reminded me of emeralds, the way the green irises sparkled. I shook my head. I thought I saw something, I murmured as we pushed our way through the crowd and into the movie theater. We waited in line and bought our tickets. Everything seemed normal enough. I kept thinking back to that glimpse I had of the pale creature skittering through the city with its thin, jointed legs. I had never seen anything like that before, not even in my nightmares. I shuddered. This is our theater, Sarah said. I followed her, silent. I felt off balance, though little did I know that things were about to get much worse. I looked down at my arms, seeing goosebumps rise all over my skin. Everything felt freezing cold as we walked through the door into Black Hall parallel to the stairs in the theater. The door closed behind me, but everything seemed wrong. There was no light coming from the front of the movie theater. No film was playing on the screen, if indeed there was a screen at all, because all I could see here was total blackness as if we had walked into an abyss. I didn't hear the chattering of the crowd in the seats either. In that endless void, only the breathing of myself and Sarah rang out along with my thudding heartbeat. What's going on? I asked, my voice shattering the silence. I took out my cell phone and turned it on, shining it around. Sarah stood in front of me, but we weren't in the movie theater anymore. It looked like we were standing in some sort of empty warehouse with concrete floors disappearing into the distance all around us. Deep cracks spiderwebbed their way through the floor. The walls, too, were the same bare gray concrete. They rose high into the air and my phone's dim light couldn't penetrate deep enough to find any ceiling. The air here felt cold and the wind constantly whipped through as if we were standing on top of a mountain Sarah took out her phone, too. Her eyes gleamed with panic. I turned, looking for the door we had just come through. It was there, and relief filled my heart. It looked different, cracked and ancient, the wood splintering down the middle in a jagged, lightning bolt pattern, but it was there. Did we go through the wrong door or something? Sarah whispered in a small, frightened voice. I'm so confused right now. That was our theater, wasn't it? I ignored her and ran forwards, flinging the ancient door open. 
On the other side, though, I didn't see the red carpeted hall for the movie theater, or the cheesy posters lining its walls. No, it wasn't the wrong door, I whispered, horrified. Something's happened, something bad. I don't know what it is, but... My voice trailed off as, side by side, we stared out into the strange world waiting before us. We each took a step outside onto the surface of the alien planet. The nighttime sky swirled above us, blood red and bursting with lightning that sizzled through the clouds. It whirled like a hurricane, meeting in a black eye that bubbled over with thick clouds of fiery smoke that blew across the landscape in suffocating torrents. The ground was covered in layers of fine, glossy sand that looked like obsidian. The building we stood in stretched far above our heads, appearing hundreds of stories tall. It was of a sheer, brutalist architecture composed of thick walls of cement with no windows. The top of it disappeared in the impenetrable mist of the bloody clouds. It had only one single door on this wall as far as I could see, a wall which stretched out for what looked like thousands of feet in each direction. It almost appeared like an optical illusion with the smooth, gray concrete disappearing off in the distance. It looked like a windowless gray warehouse in my mind, though perhaps, in hindsight, it was really more of a prison. Throughout the massive chamber of the warehouse, there was a white glare that continuously cut out and turned back on every few seconds. Hanging down on cables hundreds of feet long stood thousands of flickering fluorescent lights. They strobed on and off with an incessant tinking, pinging sound. So much for going back the way we came, I said, shaking my head grimly. Am I dead right now? Are we in hell or something? Sarah gave a short bark of sarcastic laughter. That sounded far too loud in the eerie setting. It looked like some endless empty warehouse built on an alien planet. I've heard of stories like this, she whispered, her face pale and covered in sweat, her eyes wide and dilated. Some people call it no clipping. I thought it was all a bunch of bullshit, but how else could you explain this? It's like we accidentally went through the wrong door into another world. No clipping? I asked. I would have laughed if I weren't petrified with terror. That's from some 90s video games. I think Doom and Duke Nukem. It's just a cheat code that allows you to walk through walls. It's just what people call it, she repeated, shaking her head. I didn't make it up. I think it's more likely someone drugged us or something, I said. Or probably just me. I bet you're not even real. Maybe I'm just talking to myself, drooling on the floor somewhere with a dart of Bromo Dragon fly sticking out of my back. Sarah looked out onto the alien landscape and the black volcanic sands that stretched off as far as the eye could see. The swirling of the clouds in the sky seemed to grow faster. They threw off rusty streaks of bloody light that flashed in regular intervals and lit up the world with a blinding crimson radiance. At first, I thought it had started to rain outside. I saw drops of what looked like luminescent, orange-red hail falling from the sky and raining down on the black sands below. But as it rapidly grew closer with a roaring like a tornado, I realized the sky was raining drops of liquid magma. They sizzled and popped as they fell through the air in a fiery blur. The earth greedily sucked the molten lava into its dark skin. A smell like matches and campfire smoke filled the area as clouds of choking black smoke rose high into the air. No, it's real, Sarah exclaimed in a horrified voice as she quickly backpedaled away from the door and the approaching showers of lava. It's coming towards us. Close the door. Close it. Close it. But my body felt sluggish and far away. Nothing seemed to be reacting like it should. I could only stare at the flames as they filled the world with their sizzling radiance. Fifty feet away, then thirty, then ten. Sarah grabbed my shoulder, snapping me out of reverie. I stumbled back inside the warehouse and slammed the ancient-looking door closed behind me. 
The roar of the fire continued outside, smashing against the roof high above our heads with a sound like a hurricane. I tried to scream, but I couldn't hear my own voice over the ear-splitting cacophony. The fluorescent lights high above us with their cords, like endless snakes, stopped their flickering at that moment, shutting off abruptly and plunging us into total darkness. The sound of a siren started from all around us, ringing out from the walls and floor of the giant concrete structure itself. It reminded me of a tornado siren, rising and falling in an eerie, ghostly moan, as if the spirits of the dead were themselves wailing in agony. We took out our cell phones, shining the lights out in front of us. The bouncing shadows went skittering out across the smooth concrete floor. We stood there, huddled together and terrified. You know what this reminds me of, I whispered. The firestorm had passed overhead, and though the reverberations of the molten drops hitting the roof still echoed across the endless chamber, the sound had grown faded and distant as the storm continued off into the distance. I heard a case in Hungary where a school bus full of kids were traveling in the absolute middle of nowhere. Apparently, the few people who lived in the area saw a bright light in the sky and heard an explosion. Later on, someone found the school bus, but all the kids and the bus driver had disappeared, except for two twin girls. But you know what the strangest part is? Both of the girls claimed they didn't have any siblings, that they had no twins, and that they had no idea who the other person was. Sarah covered her face with her hands. That doesn't help us at all, she said, shaking her head. Ah. What if this kind of stuff happens all the time, though? I continued. What if those kids ended up in a place like this? What if they just fell through a doorway into another reality or were taken? So who was the real twin? I don't get it, she said. I don't know. Maybe neither of them. I think you're missing the point here. Maybe there's other people here. Maybe there's another way back to the regular world. If there's a doorway here, then there must be another doorway that leads back somewhere, right? Maybe there's hundreds of doorways that lead into this place. Maybe there's millions, I said. Sarah opened her mouth to say something when the siren started again, followed by a deep man's voice. He spoke like a radio broadcaster announcing a terrorist attack, using a grim, emotionless tone. Alert. The dead things are crawling. Alert. Level 5, firestorm in progress. Alert. The dead things are crawling. Alert. Level 5 Firestorm is approaching in your direction. Please seek cover immediately. Remain in hiding until the danger has passed. Alert. The dead are rising. Alert. The dead are rising. Please take shelter immediately. The voice repeated. The siren wail rang out for a couple seconds, and then the message started repeating again. It sounded like there were speakers built into the walls and floor of the structure all around us, but I saw no vents, no boxes, or wires. The lights far overhead flickered in time with the booming alert. After about 30 seconds, the voice abruptly cut out in the middle of its sentence. Emergency alert. The dead are rising. Emergency all lol. It droned on before the alert and the lights both cut out at the same time. There was a whining sound, as if countless hidden fans were slowly whirring to a stop. I looked over at Sarah with a panicked expression, but as I opened my mouth to say something, the booming voice gave one last deep, drawn-out warning. Look! Behind! You! It hissed as it deepened into something inhuman, something demonic and brimming with evil. Her and in. My heart felt like a block of ice as I spun on my heels, raising my phone's light in front of me like a shield. Sarah's face had gone pale, and she wavered on her feet, looking as if she might pass out. The darkness pressed in on all sides, but the voice had been right. We weren't alone anymore. Something that looked like an old woman stood there only a few feet away, but everything about her looked wrong. She had a face as white as burning desert sands. Wrapped around her body, 
She wore a moth-eaten funeral shawl that looked as black as death. Her pale, nude body had bloody steel bars forced through her arms and chest. The steel rebar had been bent and twisted around her torso, ending in points sharp enough to skewer a human heart. The blood-stained bars formed a cage-like covering over her mutilated bone-white flesh. Around these deep wounds, the skin hung, ragged and loose. Pieces of sharp steel jutted out from the ends of her fingers, ripping their way out of the flesh like talons. She grinned, and even her teeth were wicked points of glinting metal. She opened her mouth. Black clotted blood gurgled and spun within. Her jaw unhinged, showing that her tongue had been cut out. The bloody infected stump squirmed with maggots. Her filmy eyes seemed to look through us as she stood there, as motionless as a statue. Neither Sarah nor I moved for a long moment. I came to life then, stumbling back and away from this otherworldly abomination. As soon as I moved a single step, her neck snapped up with a cracking of bone, her head ratcheted towards me. With twisting, jerking movements, she started towards me. Run! I screamed, tearing off without looking back to see if Sarah would follow. The smell from the old woman was wretched, like the stench of putrefying meat and formaldehyde. I headed straight into the heart of the massive building, hoping that it wasn't all just empty, bare concrete. I heard the thudding of feet behind me. Glancing back, I saw Sarah only a few feet behind me. The corpse of the old woman was close behind her, only a couple paces away. Her slashed legs skittered forward, leaving a trail of writhing maggots and drops of black blood in her wake. As we sprinted forward into the center of the warehouse, it seemed to open up around us like an abyss. The only wall fell further and further behind, but up ahead, there was a crimson glow in the great pool of shadows, something that shone like an emergency light. I pushed myself to the limit, but I knew I couldn't keep up this pace much longer. Sarah and I neared the bloody glow with the pale corpse of the old woman still close behind us. I could hear the gnashing of her metal teeth and her congested breathing, smell the stink of rot and death that emanated from her like a cloud. I realized that the red light was actually an elevator, stuck in the center of this immense abyss. Its shaft soared straight up into the air, disappearing from view in the darkness. The metal doors stood open, as if the elevator were waiting for us, I wondered where it led. A sudden scream erupted from behind me. I turned, seeing Sarah on the ground, the undead corpse writhing on top of her. Her metal teeth snapped together with a sharp ringing sound. Sarah had her arm up and was pushing with all her strength against the old woman's neck. But the old woman snapped and bit at the air, and with every bite, it seemed her face lowered another fraction of an inch closer to Sarah's eyes, her nose, her lips. Sarah would be ripped to shreds, her flesh sliced to pieces as if by a wood chipper. I saw the sharp points of metal poking from the corpse's torso biting into Sarah's skin. Thin rivulets of blood soaked into her clothes. I ran forwards in a blind fury, my vision turning white with adrenaline as I brought my boot up into the old woman's chalk-white face. Her head snapped back, the neck cracking like a tree branch. Her head ratcheted up to face me, her pale cataract eyes gleaming with a rabid hunger. I backpedaled as she lunged forward, leaping through the air like a cat. Sarah lay on the ground, moaning and bleeding, temporarily forgotten by the abomination. I reached into my pocket, frantically looking for anything to defend myself with. I only felt my car keys. I brought the fob out with its point of steel. At that moment, she tackled me to the ground, a piece of steel stab into my left shoulder as I was forced down. She wrapped her sharp claws around my throat, choking me. The points slashed into my neck, leaving deep gouges that burned like fire. It felt like thousands of needles stabbed their way into my throat as I tried to scream. I held the fob like a knife in my right hand, clenched tightly in my fist. I brought my knee up and smashed it into her with a sudden rush of adrenaline, 
feeling her cold steel talons release my throat. A moment later, the undead woman's head snapped forward, biting deeply into my neck. I screamed as I struggled, writhing under her weight. I managed to free my right arm and brought the sharp point of the key straight up into her filmy eye. She gave a wail as she twitched, shaking her head from side to side. The key stayed firmly implanted. As cold, thick blood dripped from her exploded eye onto my face, I reached up and smashed the end of the fob with my palm, forcing the end deeper into her skull. I felt her weight lift off me suddenly. Sarah stood next to her, pushing at the exposed ribs of her putrefying torso, shoving her to the side. The sharp end of the key remained stuck in her rotted skull. The old woman went sprawling. Sarah reached down and helped pull me up off the ground. As the undead creature's banshee shriek reverberated all around us, we sprinted into the elevator. The undead woman leaked blood and gore all over the concrete in the bloody glow of the elevator's lights as she crawled forward on all fours in our direction. Sarah frantically began slamming the buttons on the elevator. As the undead woman came within inches of the threshold, the metal doors finally slid shut with a faint whirring. I released a long breath I didn't even realize I was holding. Covered in blood, both my own and the old woman's, I leaned heavily against the glass wall. The elevator began ascending up the shaft at a rapid pace. My stomach filled with butterflies as we rose. Man, are you okay? I asked breathlessly as we stared out the glass panes. Sarah was grabbing her stomach. I saw trickles of blood staining her white shirt and crimson blotches. I kept one hand on my neck, trying to stem the bleeding. I felt trickles of warm blood running through my fingers. Nothing fatal, she whispered, though she was clearly in pain. So was I. I groaned, grabbing my head. Sarah was crying, her tears dripping down her face like drops of wax. Still stumbling, I went over and hugged her. She put her head against my shoulder, sobbing. We're going to die here, aren't we? No, no, absolutely not, I said, not believing a word of it. The worst is behind us. After rising thousands of feet into the air, the elevator's whirring gears began to slow. Above us, another level of the warehouse opened up. The shaft of the elevator rose through the center of a steel ceiling. We passed through and into something strange. It looks like a mall, Sarah said as the elevator doors opened. In front of us stood a dimly lit hallway lined with dark stores on both sides. On the top, in ancient, rusted letters, I read, The Badlands Mall. I didn't recognize the names of any of the stores, and there were some odd ones. I saw a shop that said Dahmer's Fresh Meats, with naked, butchered bodies strung up in the display windows, their arms, legs, and heads all cut off, their skin removed to show the glistening muscle underneath. Maggots had long ago infested the putrefying meat. Next to it was a giant department store, with the bubbly name of Perilos engraved above the entrance. But this was no ordinary department store. Instead of mannequins showing off clothes, the entire department store was filled with torture tools. Iron maidens and roaring bulls were set up out front. Many of the tools looked used, soiled with strips of flesh and pieces of rotting gore. Flies buzzed all around them, and a fetid smell like the bowels of hell wafted out of the department store in our direction. Perillos had mannequins in many of the soiled torture tools, naked, pale mannequins covered in gore and blood. The fluorescent lights running overhead had power here, though they were dim. They flickered constantly, sending dancing shadows skittering across the mall. I think we're in some kind of mall from hell, I whispered, wincing as even that echoed across the marble and off the glass panes of the stores. Come on, let's go. Why? Sarah asked, a deep sense of terror reflected in her eyes. I don't want to go out there. Let's just wait here in the elevator and... Wait for what? I said, scoffing. Rescue? You think anyone knows we're here? We don't even know where the hell we are. We need to keep moving forward. 
there must be some connection back to the real world. There must be. I didn't know if I was trying to convince myself or her. Sarah shook her head. I could see she was sweating heavily, her hands trembling. I don't want to, she said in a voice like a little girl. I took her hand and pulled her forward. We limped out of there together. We have to, I insisted. Keep an eye out for any sort of useful weapons. That bitch took my only fob from my car. It's probably still stuck in her eyeball. We could go check in there, Sarah said, motioning to Perillo's department store with its grisly array of torture devices. I shook my head quickly. No, not there, I responded, casting a disgusted look at the patches of rotting skin still sticking to the open iron maidens, the burnt, melted fat leaking out of the roaring bulls. I'm not sure we're alone up here, and I have a bad feeling about that place. Every time I glimpsed one of the faceless mannequins out of the corner of my eye, it made my heart leap in my chest, thinking it was a person. The mannequins were crucified, impaled or nailed to the ceilings and walls in front of Perios. It looked like hundreds of them filled the store. Even stranger, they all appeared to have blood crusted on their naked, plastic bodies. And it was a lot of blood. A shiver ran down my spine as we hurried away without looking back. The stores and shops lining both sides of the dark, flickering hallway got stranger and stranger. There was a rundown ice cream shop called Brownies. On the dust covered menu, they advertised ice cream in many flavors, including bloody puss flavored, maggot flavored, and tombstone flavored ice cream. Through the clear plexiglass, I saw rancid buckets of foul smelling sludge that might once have been ice cream. I was staring at two broken down vending machines. One had drinks and advertised Springy's Lemon Lime Soda, Kana Brand Cola, and St. Christoph's Ginger Ale. The other had strange foods, including Overholzer's Beef Jerky, chocolate bars with caramel and peanuts called Eisenhart's, Took's Saltwater Taffy, and Riza's Fruit Snacks. This is truly bizarre, Sarah whispered, looking around furtively. It's like we've wandered into a parallel earth with its own brands and stores, but where are all the people? As if in answer to her question, we heard something dragging behind us. There was a low whispering of many voices though they formed no words. It created a low susurration more reminiscent of a den of hissing snakes. With horror, I glanced behind me and saw the mannequins from the store crawling down the hall towards us. Their smooth, faceless heads ratcheted up as if they had gears in their necks. With jerky movements, they twisted forward, their flat palms smacking the marble floor. Drops of thick, old blood dripped from their plastic bodies. They had no mouths, but I could hear the low gurgling of their strange voices all the same. Hundreds of these pale forms slithered through the halls. I took off running. A second later, I heard Sarah's thudding footsteps close behind me. We passed by dozens of eerie, dark stores. In the glass displays of many, naked mannequins covered in gore came to life as we passed, their heads twisting to follow us, their arms and legs shivering with newfound energy. At the end of the hallway, I saw a familiar sign above a massive department store. It said Sears. The doors opened up into a dark, mildewed chamber filled with rusted metal shelving and debris. Without any better ideas, I turned to scream at Sarah, pointing at the store. It's a goddamned Sears, we need to get to it. Her pace had turned chalk white, her eyes wide with terror. I realized the skittering mannequins were only feet behind her. As a gurgler has said from its mouthless face, one of the mannequins reached forward and grabbed Sarah's ankle. She fell forward, smashing her heat hard against the marble floor. I heard the bone give a crack as a blossom of blood exploded from her forehead. Moaning, she tried to crawl away as the mannequin swarmed her, ripping her skin off with their sharp plastic fingers. I glimpsed this horror only for a moment. It was the last image I would ever have of my wife, the woman I loved. With the last of my fading strength, 
I pushed myself forward. Sarah's dying screams followed me into the sears. I heard more of the tapping limbs of the mannequins close behind me, but I dared not look back. As I ran through the smashed glass doors leading into the abandoned department store, Sarah's screams abruptly cut off. For a few moments I thought I still heard the hissing whispers of the mannequins, but then that too went silent. I wandered through the dilapidated sears under waterlogged ceilings and over thick layers of dust. Eventually I found the front of the store and smashed my way out of the door. I was in the middle of a parking lot for a mall that looked like it had been abandoned since the 1990s. I took you in. I saw a highway stretching out nearby, filled with headlights streaming in both directions. I wandered right out of the abandoned mall parking lot and down a winding ramp until I found myself on some sort of bridge. Injured and exhausted, I pushed myself forward with the last of my energy. After a few more minutes, I finally came to a house. Frantically, I knocked on the door and asked for help. They called the police, who were totally baffled by everything. I tried to tell them. Apparently, my wife and I had been missing for over two weeks even though less than a day had passed for us. Even stranger, however, I ended up thousands of miles away from where I started, seemingly teleported there from the procession of strange doors of the Badlands. My wife and I had started our trip over in Boston, and by the time I staggered out, bloody and terrified, I found myself in an abandoned mall near San Jose, California. Now I always check every room before I enter it, that hellish place took my wife from me and gave me enough nightmares to last an entire lifetime. I never want to see that abandoned mall of horrors or that swirling blood-red sky again.